in the background, the next question is, well, what's the right level? And I was just as confused about it as you are. And you know what? No one agrees on what the normal level should be, but I have two things to share with you. The first one is, I had a very simple question. What if we give D and we ask everybody, how's their sleep? Like completely simple. I have all these patients that when you ask them, how's your sleep? The majority of them say, terrible, I can't fall asleep, or I wake up at 3 a.m. and I can't go back to sleep. Frequently, this population is young, healthy females who've had a couple of kids. They shouldn't have any medical problems, yet sleep disorders are extremely common in the mom and the kid. So the first question is, if everybody says over 30 is okay, well, why do these people feel so awful? Okay. And I just spent five years giving them CPAP if they had sleep apnea. The great majority of them did not have sleep apnea. They just didn't have the deeper phases, especially rapid eye movement sleep, which affects our mood and our memory. So the, these are important things that are, these women are coming in saying, I have a really bad mood and I can't remember anything. I'm having a hard time taking care of my kids. And all we say to them is, oh, you have three kids. What do you expect? Okay. No, that's not a that's not a right answer. So ultimately I had a question. Is there a vitamin D level that would make my patients who are otherwise healthy people ha sleep better? So I would just send them off for a D level and they'd come back and see me every three months. And I'd say, okay, are you taking that D? And I'd go, and they go, yeah. And I'm learning what the doses should be. Because as you mentioned, each person needs a different dose and then you have to arrive at a certain level. And then if the level doesn't really make sense for the how the person feels. And your next question is, do they need a little more, a little less? And we're willing as a nutritionist, and we should be willing as a physician to have that conversation. How do you feel? Okay. Now, I didn't know how to do it. And I start with little tiny doses. And most of the time, my patients would come back and say, I feel terrible. And my sleep is still awful. And I'm like, are you taking that vitamin D? And they go, yeah. And I was like, okay, you're taking 2000, right? Yeah. And we do their levels again. Their first level was 28 and we moved, that was in the fall and we moved into the winter and now their level is 22. I'm like, wait, the FDA says 1000 I use. This makes no sense. It took me two years to get good with the dosing. And it turns out that that blood level that you're measuring is the leftovers. When you're really deficient, you take this in by mouth or in the skin and every cell that's using it, like billions and billions of cells that have been very deficient go, whoa, yeah. That means what you see in the blood is what didn't get absorbed into the cell. So it wasn't uncommon for the levels to go down and everybody says they're not absorbing it. That is wrong. They absolutely are absorbing it. They're absorbing it into the cell. Now, the next step was we actually had a clinical observation where the patient started to come back and say, you know what? Three weeks ago, my sleep started to get better. The other thing that I know that wasn't really common at the time was you can really trust a, a human being's claim about their sleep. They're not stupid. They've been living in this body for a while. They can tell you details about their sleep. They know when they feel better. So that actually started to happen as D crossed 60. So 60 to 80, and there's a lot about how do we tell what the upper level is? John Connell said, there is no upper level. There's no toxicity. And then I could swear that he changed what he said and said, yeah, there's no toxicity, but don't go over 80. And by the time I found that, I was feeling miserable and my D level was 90. And there's a long discussion about what studies we have. But ultimately, the biologic studies show that in a normal situation where you live outdoors all the time, you cannot run your D level over 80 just by sun exposure. There are also regulatory effects that break the D down so it doesn't even get absorbed. So there is a, a homeostatic mechanism that was studied actually in lifeguards early in the 60s. But 60 to 80 since 2009 has maintained as making a difference in a sleep disorder. Now, does that mean that that's the ideal level for D? No, it really doesn't mean that. Because that what that implies is I have been so D deficient for so long that I have developed this really bad condition. And that probably means that my cell, what I have to do with the level is overshoot to some extent because it's they're sucking up so much D. If you look at the literature about what, what is the D level in hunter gatherers who don't really even have a hut, and they've done those studies in North Africa, followed these guys around, published that, and shown that their D levels are mean. Keep in mind what I said about the mean level. The mean levels are in the 40s for the whole population. Let's say there's 85 people living in, in as a group. What that also implies is 
If you want to biohack with this, the question you'd like to ask that population is, who's the best performer? Who kills the lion? Who's the strongest? And what age are they? Because if you average in the 85-year-olds that are traveling with them, the other basic truth is, as we get into our 70s, our production of D from the same amount of sun exposure goes down. That means we don't really know what the ideal is. And I would claim that you really want to be careful with D. You should not biohack with it if there's nothing wrong with you. The 125-OH that's called the active chemical that you measure in the blood has a very limited effect. It's being secreted in the blood. That conversion from 25-OH to 125-OH is done in the kidney, but that sluicing through the blood is going into the inside of the bone and it's affecting bone metabolism and a few other things. But it has nothing to do with the nervous system which is where I live. I want to know what's happening in the brain. And it's the 25 OH that has a carrier protein, like all hormones do, that flows around in the blood and then is transmitted over into the brain. It's also transmitted into multiple other organs that are not using that 125 OH. They are taking in the 25 OH, putting it in the cell, and they have the enzyme that converts it to 125 OH. And they make that when they need it within a specific range of what am I using this for? So that means we have an idea of what the blood level is, but in fact, we don't know what the brain level is. So we know so little that we have to err on the side of asking the patient to be an active participant in this program.